Hi there, and welcome to the Psychology Wire podcast with me, Connor Whiteley. So, ecology student and internationally best-selling author of over 30 psychology books, bringing you the latest psychology news and tons of fascinating psychology topics each week. If you want to learn more about psychology, then please check out my books and the backlist of the podcast at conorwiley.net forward slash podcast. And please make sure you subscribe to the channel and you will like it so that you don't miss any new videos. And here's the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 190 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Colin Whiteley. And today's episode is on What's Wrong with the Perfect Body? And it is Saturday, the 4th of February 2023, as I record this. So today's episode is one of probably one of the best episodes that I've done in quite a while. Because today's episode is a great mixture of lots of different great psychological topics. For example, eating disorders, body image, and lots of other clinical psychology topics. So this is just a topic that I absolutely love. I'm really, um, like, quite passionate about it. And there's a lot of, like, um, good points mentioned in today's episode. So if you want to learn about what's wrong with the perfect body, then uh, please uh, keep uh, listening. But moving on to the psychology news section, we've been from the British Psychological Society Research Digest, and the first one is a personal favourite. The caf coffee reduces caffeine withdrawal, even if you know it's decaf. If you're a regular coffee drinker, you're probably familiar with the unpleasant feeling that comes after a long period without a hit of alpha caffeine. Headaches, grogginess, irritability, they were all symptoms of caffeine withdrawal. The obvious solution is of course to make yourself a fresh cup of coffee and let the cycle of a caffeine addiction continue. But what if there's a way to get rid of those symptoms without ingesting more caffeine? Amongst heavy coffee drinkers, drinking a decaf can apparently combat symptoms of withdrawal, and this placebo effect occurs even when people are fully aware that coffee is decaf. So this I think is quite amazing, and it really does show the full impact of uh, the mind, and even though if we know it's something that's true, why? we can basically still make ourselves like believe that because of this is coffee it has a caffeine in it and this is gonna help us caffeine with the draw though so it's a really powerful effect i always love a research like this because the mind is a truly like amazing amazing though and the link between our well, between our mind and our body is always something that's really interesting that's like look at that world because there is a connection. We aren't always sure how exactly like it works, but it always is fascinating to actually look at. So personally, even though I love coffee, I wouldn't I wouldn't call myself like a heavy coffee drinker. Maybe I have three cups a day. And apparently some people think that that's a lot, but then I see people drinking like eight cups of tea, so yeah, but like a tea though, and even though there isn't as much caffeine in the tea, in fact I think there's barely anything compared to coffee, I don't know why eight cups of tea is, yeah, but like isn't heavy drinking, but three cups of coffee is. It doesn't quite make sense, like, to me, though. <laughs> yeah, at least I, that's how I, like, tell uh, myself, though. But I've never suffered from caffeine with a jaw wall. 
that actually probably has no effect on me anyway. So it was always like um, interesting. So we're moving on to the next one. K-pop lyrics have become more positive over the past 30 years. And just as a um, FYI, I don't listen to K-pop. I only have a vague recollection of what it actually is. I know it's Korean pop music. It'd be really embarrassing if that isn't it. But um, let's just dive into what the article actually is. (laughs) How do you track emotional changes within the population of a country without embarking on large-scale costly surveys or lab-based studies? One idea is to look for changes in lyrics of hit songs, the emotional context of those lyrics, some researchers argue, um, may mirror the emotions that are dominant within a culture. The latest study to take care of this approach looks at K-pop hits from the past 30 years. It finds that lyrics have a gradually come to include more positive and less negative emotional content, a trend that runs in the opposite direction to that seen in studies on popular songs in the US and UK. Okay, so there's actually quite a few things to actually unpack here. So first of all, let's look at this research method. So you're looking at hit songs. Now I understand the logic of this because hit songs means they're very, very popular within a country. Tons of people relate to these songs. Um, these songs can make people feel something that makes them popular. So they want, so people want to keep listening to them. I completely get that, and that's actually quite a good point too. But not everyone listens to hit songs. Not everyone in like society takes part in like music culture. And it's like me, I can't I cannot remember the last popular song I listened to out of the need to like listen to a like big hit. Because my music they tend to be very instrumental. And basically my song tastes are like quite weird. Um they're mainly instrumental. I got a like sea shanty that I listen to like quite a bit, and then the rest of my music that tends to be done up by um, songs that I've heard on like TV programs because they've been used as films, and then I just listen and, like to the full version of like that. So um, I wouldn't say that this captures everyone. I would say this only captures a demographic. Uh, that actually listens to like music, so um, it's interesting, and I see where it's uh, coming from, but I'm not sure this is the perfect way to go about it, even though, to be honest, there's no such thing as a perfect way to go about anything, so um, interesting. And then uh, the only other thing that I wanted to mention about this was the trend of the direction. I definitely agree with that point, because... I do feel that music in the US and the UK, and again, I do talk about this from someone who does not listen to pop music much, <laughs> much though, Ill, is that even though it does seem to be mainly like love songs, uh, if you listen to the sort of beats, the sort of content from like, music from the 80s and the 70s, it actually doesn't seem as much um, positive, as, or positive as of the songs coming out now. So, very interesting, and I definitely think that this study should be done again. And yeah, like uh, to be honest, and more research should be done like this area just to check if these findings are scientifically true because they're interesting. I'm just not sure of this research method. And the last one is, we give kids mixed messages about lying. This is so true. 
Um, attitude to children lying is inconsistent. Children can sometimes be honest in situations where we would really rather they weren't, and maybe even face a, face a punishment as a result. But we also put on an emphasis on encouraging children to tell the truth, even though what we know ourselves lie. A new study highlights the conflicting views that we have about lying in the kids. Adults prefer children who were lied to be polite, to like to those who were bluntly told to be a truth, for instance, but when a lie was motivated by an attempt to protect a sibling, it was frowned upon. And even when the people saw lies in a positive light, they still felt truth attempts were more trustworthy. Given the findings, it's no wonder we send children such mixed messages about lying. And yeah, we seriously do, because, yeah, well, because, I mean, every child sort of has to, it does take quite a while to think about when is a good time to lie and when is a good time to tell the truth. And I'm sure that's just thrown like some of you, but telling the truth and actually knowing when to lie is a really like complex I think that well because of the traditional idea about children must not lie whatsoever that is that just doesn't work and the idea that even adults shouldn't lie whatsoever because sometimes we need to tell white lies to protect someone's feelings and like someone that like that we love that's okay, but that is still lying, and then there are other times, uh, times uh, when we need to tell slightly bigger lies to also help protect like, someone. For example, if uh, your like, best friend left uh, work early and uh, you want to cover like for them, even though that is lying, and lying's bad, you've still done it to protect someone, so lying is never straightforward. And a and I should be writing a forensic psychology book online like this year, so this will be quite an interesting topic to actually like talk about. This is a very hard area because you can never let a children live by the rule where that lying is always good because sometimes like it isn't because. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, like, because sometimes it can actually be quite embarrassing to parents, and because I was a child once, a very innocent one, I've said some stuff before that got my parents to be quite you know, embarrassed, and like vice versa. So, um, I don't know, so truth is a hard one. Of course, in every moment of our lives, we should always try to be truthful, but I think that the line gets very blurry when it comes to lying uh, to protect the people that we love and we care about. So very, very interesting indeed. So I hope you enjoy the psychology news section. I know that I have. So let's move on to the personal update. So, but this week has been a like, very a good week uh, doing uh, like tons of different bits and pieces uh, for myself and uh, the university final project uh, for my dissertation. But this week's actually been quite funny because um, Monday, Monday just didn't go to plan. And uh, there is a reason why I'm telling you like this because. Uh, we had so many dropouts, we had, we had our pistons pretty much disappearing, left, right and centre because one person was ill, another one was a no-show, so I deducted her 12 credits, even though like, it makes me sound and like a bit of a like sadist, it felt so good because you cannot just book to be part of a like egg experiment and then not show up. That's a massive waste of time for egg experimenters. 
So that's just really, really uh, annoying. And then we had this awkward, yeah, but like this awkward like nerve show incident too. <laughs> yeah, to that best. The reason why I'm like telling like you this is that if there is any psychology students here, then please just know that it's a normal thing. This really is a normal thing though, because when you do any sort of like research, either as a student or as a professional, there will be no shows. There will be really annoying people. <laughs> and then sometimes you will have to let go of people simply because of no fault of uh, their own though. It's natural and it does make stuff a bit more interesting. And you can always laugh about it. So, well, that's just some of the like, realities of a do like data collection. Also, but this week, I do actually want to give a shout out to Jennifer Birch because she actually like, um, reached out to me there to see if she could do a like, um, I guess a poster. And even though I no longer accept like guess a post. I did uh, read uh, through her like a uh, portfolio, and I really do like like recommend her. So if there were any um I don't know like um psychology bloggers or people like or people like that listening like uh, to the podcast, then I really do like recommend her. And I did say uh, that I would give her a shout out, and I would share her email address in case anyone actually wanted to like contact her for any work. So in case any of you did uh, want to like hire her though like um her like, email address is Jen with the two ends Ivybirch at gmail dot com and her articles are really good. And then, like, all of the other stuff that I've been doing is that many are just, like, coursework and other university stuff. So, as always, I always, like, love to hear your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So, you can always email me, conwiley, net. You can always leave a comment on the show notes at conwiley.net forward slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at Sci-Fi Wiley. I always love to hear from all of you because it helps to make the podcast more a, a conversation. And you can always leave a comment on the Facebook post at Con Wiley, Psychology Author. And today's episode has been sponsored by Cognitive Psychology, a guide to... Neuroscience, Neuropsychology and Cognitive Psychology, 3rd edition. So, but this is an absolute brilliant sponsor for today's episode, because the way how like, body image works and those sort of like negative um, connotations and all of the mental health difficulties that it causes are many down to a person's like cognitive uh, processes the attitudes and a bunch of other things that are based in that cog in cognition. So uh, this is a great, really easy to understand book uh, just to help you understand uh, like thinking biases, how uh, thinking works and it really does build upon today's episode. And uh, this is a very popular book uh, that always sells uh, Tens of uh, copies every a single month, fly like, without fail. So, if you want a, a great, really easy to understand guide to uh, cognitive psychology, then uh, definitely check it out. So, that's cognitive psychology, a guide to neuroscience, neuropsychology, and cognitive psychology, available from all major ebook retailers. And you can get the payback and hardback versions from Amazon, your local bookstore, or local library if you request it. And you can buy the ebook directly from me at payhip.com forward slash Conwiley.
So, but let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So, moving on to the content part of today's episode. So, we're going to be looking at what's wrong with the perfect body. So, this is a great podcast episode. I really do enjoy this. And because this is quite a long podcast episode, because it's filled up with so much great um, content, I'm actually just going to dive straight into it. The idea of the perfect body is it's something that really does influence society, and you could even argue that it plagues us, because it is everywhere. It is on social media, in movies and TV programs. Since if you think about the last major film or television program you will watch that was a blockbuster, then you probably imagine a scarily thin sexy women with perfect beautiful bodies with long perfect hair, or men with stunning muscles, the perfect body, and the perfectly strong jawline and more. Of course, none of these definitions are healthy whatsoever, natural or positive in the slightest, and these have actually been changing in recent years. Since in recent years, the bodies of these actors and actresses are becoming more and more extreme, and further away from the average body of the average man or woman. For example, if you look at Hugh Jackman in the early 2000s, his body was described as being perfect in those days, but now he has become more increasingly lean and massive over these two decades, with Jackman saying that the next Wolverine is going to be, going to be even bigger and the biggest ever Wolverine. This is also supported by a recent accountability post by the actor Jay Castorman, posted on his personal Instagram account that I do check in in every like so often. And what he said was that in his 20s, when he was filming stuff like the outpost, that his job required him him to be shirtless, most of, if not all of the time, and that required him to do a hell of a lot of things for his body, and as a fan, I can confirm that there is a difference because of the accountability post, but it's definitely a healthier difference. And to be honest, I think personally it's really good of him to actually acknowledge that and do it as an accountability post. And also, though, I'm not singling him out, but his honesty does make a lot of good a point, because he didn't say that he wanted to do the egg extreme things, things though, even though he obviously did end up like, doing them, but, but what he said was that his job required him, uh, you know, but, like, required him like, to do it, so I doubt he would have done it so quite as much, if uh, the job didn't really acquire him might uh, to do it. Again, this uh, basically hocks uh, back uh, to the idea of, uh, of the uh, perfect uh, body image and uh, what film companies we uh, acquire. Body image and social media. In addition, uh, social media reflects really this increase in impossible standards uh, for the so-called perfect body, and as an Instagram user, I know that Instagram is literally clogged with tons of so-called first trap selfies featuring muscular men with minimal body fat percentage, as well as long gun under all 2021 found that posts like these receive a dis- disproportionately positive response from other social media users. So this reinforces this to the men that are posting this away. In other words, 
the positive re response reinforces these uh, these in the positive standards and the so called need for these standards in the people who look like this. Moreover, in a 2020 qualitative study by Glaxo Renault analyzed photos posted by men on Instagram and found the exact same thing. Most photos posted in the sample depicted a lot of muscles and lean body mass. Then, to measure this perceived need for males to be muscular, McCary created a psychonautic scale measuring the drive for masculinity in 2017, and the researcher noted that, that no body fat received packed up with muscles is often considered the male ideal. Also, McCree 2017 found that men felt worse about their physical appearance after looking at and absorbing the idealised and hypermuscular images and other content found on Instagram, as well as Carve F and all 2002 showed that these are body image concerns reduce amounts of confidence self-esteem and overall life satisfaction, just like they do for women. Why I'm not picking on Instagram here. So I just want to make it clear here to people on the website and on the podcast that I'm not picking on Instagram here, but I do want to highlight it. Since this is where the research is done, Instagram is an image-based uh, platform, so it's perfect for sharing idealised body images, and the recommendation algorithms are scary. And to be honest, just to be honest, because I always believe in being honest with you, like, like uh, listeners, whenever I click on like these um, idealised um, images, yeah, but like images that when I next go on the like Instagram, my recommendation feed is filled up with those images. So that's how scary good of these recommendation algorithms are. But to be honest, at the moment they're all filled with like book, yeah, but like books and uh, like stuff from other authors. Therefore, these are social media platforms of but of course, play a major role in uh, in uh, pushing this harmful content, which is understandable, considering the positive reactions they they get. Male body image and wider society. If uh, we step back from social media for a moment, then we can uh, see. Uh, that this is all severely affected in a general wider society, since Lucano, 2007, found that American men grow up believing that, um, that muscles signal masculinity. In other words, um, having muscles makes you a man, and all of the absolute rubbish. And I do have to almost laugh at that because the whole traditional idea is just so harmful. Harmful, which I will actually talk about in a moment. Therefore, these distorted echo expectations do more than just contribute to the constant creation and, uh, and the sharing of shirtless photos on social media. These are beliefs and attitudes can warp into the body image disorder known as muscle dysphoria. This is a dangerous condition when a sufferer becomes convinced that their body is too skinny, weak and small, and this problem is only getting worse. As a result of a 2019 study found 700 American men between the ages of 18 and 24, 
showed that more than 20% of men had a disordered relationship to food because of their desire to get bigger and more muscle bound. These young men were eating too much due to bulking up and requires a high calorie intake. They put their own health at risk by using anabolic steroids and they took dietary supplements like extra protein. International Body Image Concerns Sadly, these body image concerns are not just a common attained to only the USA because this is an international crisis. Since what's up to 40% of American men do feel anxious about their weight according to Frederick Null, 2022. In the UK, according to the Mental Health Foundation, more than 20% of Englishmen admit that they try to dress in a way that conceals part of their bodies in 2019. And yeah, to be honest, I think I'm one of those 20 to some extent. In addition, 11% of the English men reported suicidal thoughts about the negative body image concerns, as well as 4% said that they had already tried to hurt themselves for this exact reason. And that is exactly why this is dangerous. Then in France, the Journal of Men's Health 2014, up to uh, 85% of uh, French men reported uh, re- they weren't happy with their bodies because they thought they didn't have enough muscles. Finally, uh, for this section, uh, this was all only made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic because of the health-related anxieties that were swimming around in our societies could have made these are body image issues worse. Worse, a, a 2021 study see a uh, pod this by finding social distancing was linked with a higher male dissatisfaction with their muscles and weight. Overall, right before we move on, let me just say this. These body image concerns, they do kill people. They harm people and they can twist someone's mind into horrific things. I've already mentioned this in like the last podcast episode on the topic, and eating disorders are some of the deadliest mental health conditions in the world. So I don't say this to scare you at all, I say this because enough is enough, and we really do need to help fix this international mental health crisis. Why don't men talk about their body image concerns? As Rashina and Hunter pointed out in a 2014 article for the BMJ Open the Journal, a lot of men just don't want to talk about these issues also with their friends and family members. They feel we're in the significant enough all ready in their own heads without adding to the concerns about their friends and family judging them or even agreeing with them. And of course, you absolutely hope that the idea that their friends and family would agree with them and actually feed into their concerns would never happen, but you don't know, and also and also, though, as we know from a clinical psychology, it doesn't matter if something is real or not. It's real work to the person, and it's the fault that they have, so that's all what that matters. Therefore, but these men stay silent out of fear of expressing these feelings and risking them being seen as even less manly. And this is what I was saying about earlier. This is why I personally hate 
it's the idea of manliness because it is quite pathetic and it and I do not say this to um make anyone upset or sad or offend them. I'm saying this because I really am sorry, but I have no time for people who pervade the idea of manliness about but because of the idea of manliness yeah, but like manliness and like this is the idea that men are, have a stiff upper lip, they don't show emotion. Men are strong, um emotions are like for the women of the world and that sort of really like damaging stuff. The idea of like manliness is just so damaging to society. The mental health of innocent people and more that I just don't want to hear from anyone who is so um zealous about the idea of like manliness. Yeah, because yeah, because it does lead to suicide, it does lead to eating disorders and so much other stuff. Because um a book coming out this a month actually, my suicide psychology book actually does like look at that in a lot more depth. But what I do have a time for is the victims of manliness of culture and people that want to help them. And this is why I do these uh, these uh, podcast episodes because I want to help people and I want people to realise that the traditional ideas of manliness aren't only damaging but they're very outdated. Furthermore, as the 2014 article pointed out, even if these amazing men who were a perfect dinner their own way get enough courage to ask for help, some are dismissed because of people who believe body image issues are only for women and men don't have them. Again, another example of how the idea of like manliness and only like um, women have so-called problems just isn't helpful. Men and women both have these mental health difficulties. And uh, this is why knowing exactly how to identify what to look for in uh, men with uh, body image issues is critical. How to know if a man has body image issues. So very quickly for the last section of the episode. If you think that a friend or family member is having a body image issues. Then maybe look out for these signs. This isn't official advice whatsoever. But this could be the starting point if, if you're worried. Maybe your a family member or friend has gained a lot of weight all of a sudden. Maybe they've been talking about their body a lot lately. Or maybe they're bulking up excessively. Or they've been spending a lot of time in the gym or in the front of a mirror lately. This could have shown without a body image issue is a present. If this is the case, then maybe they should check out a a therapist specialising in eating disorders. Then they will help the client, of course, if the client wants her to be helped, to change their obsessive thoughts about their physical appearance and reorientate them to focus less on the external benefits and more on the effects of the long-term well-being. Conclusion So I know in the last podcast episode, which was on um, body negativity in boys, I spoke about a lot about my own eating and body image issues of the past, and that's why I love talking about this topic. As I will not pretend that I have had these issues so dire that it's destroyed me, but it honestly could have. 
I could on right, I honestly could have had an eating disorder and have been hospitalized a few right a few years ago. Because I seriously hated my body that much. I really did. And that is why I make sure that I have three meals a day, even if I'm not hungry. I'm that rigid now because I know because I know how easy it could be just to not eat. And to be honest, sometimes eating is just a pain. So where to end this episode? I want to remind you about that body image issues will uh, be seriously harmful to uh, people in uh, the end, and they are no joke. If you're a man or woman with a body image issue, then uh, please uh, talk uh, to someone, get their opinion on it, and if uh, you need it, then please seek professional help. Please don't suffer in a, in a silence, because... You are perfect just out of the way you are, and there is a massive difference between wanting to be healthy and wanting to have the perfect body. Having the perfect body never ends well. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and you got something out of it. I know that I did and I really do absolutely love this topic. So, um, if you know someone who would enjoy today's episode, then please share it with them. I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help spread the words I hear about the podcast. And if you want to learn more about thoughts and cognitive processes, then uh, please check out Cognitive Psychology, a guide to... Neuroscience, Neuropsychology and Cognitive Psychology available in all the usual places including buying it directly from me at payhip.com forward slash con widely and if you didn't want to buy a book but you still wanted to give the podcast a bit of like one time support then you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash con widely so have a great day everyone and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you have found it useful. If you want to learn more, then please go to conwiley.net forward slash podcast for the backlist and to check out my psychology books. Also, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel on YouTube or follow the podcast on your favourite podcast app. Just so you don't miss any episodes that always appear every Monday. So, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.